Hello everyone, on behalf of Innovations for Poverty Action, welcome to our webinar on entrepreneurial mindset and soft skills training for business growth. More than 50 of you have already tuned in and we're excited to get started. My name is Elizabeth Koshi and I lead the Entrepreneurship and Private Sector Development Program at IPA. I will be your moderator and host for the event with the support of Daniela Graney and Jose Pinilla. The EPSD program collaborates with researchers, practitioners, and policymakers to create and share rigorous evidence that can help the design and implementation of evidence-based solutions to support entrepreneurship and business growth in low and middle-income countries. Today, we will focus on entrepreneurial mindset training programs, one such promising solution that addresses the challenges of poor managerial capacity among small businesses. In before we launch into the webinar, I'd like to go over some housekeeping announcements. And we will change the slide to that. You can see the IPA team on the slide and my host for the evening for today will be Daniela Graney and Jose Pinilla as well. Going over some housekeeping announcements, the structure for the webinar is pretty packed. We have presentations, we will have a panel discussion, we will have a Q&A that will be woven in both at at the time of the presentations and also during the panel discussion. Please submit your questions through the chat at any point. Uh, my co-hosts will be moderating the chat, answering your questions. Our presenters have also agreed to answer questions in chat. So please uh, ask your questions in the chat. Given the nature of this being a webinar, we won't be able to allow for other participants to speak, but know that you know, your questions will be answered. And if, if you're comfortable doing so, please let us know who you are when you ask your question so that we can tailor our response accordingly. As you can see, closed captioning is available in English. Simply click the show captions button. This webinar will be recorded and added to the IPA website. So any of you that is hoping to share this webinar with your colleagues, with partners and others that you think might be interested, a link should be available soon. And for any technical difficulties, please contact Daniela Graney, who is available on the, through the chat function. As you saw from the title, today's webinar is the first in a series of webinars associated with the launching of a new report from IPA on best bets or emerging opportunities for impact at scale. We'll kick things off with a presentation by Carla Peterson, IPA Scaling Director, who will introduce the report and contextualize how the topic of today's discussion connects with the report and IPA's commitment to discovering and advancing what works to improve the lives of people living in poverty. We will then move into entrepreneurial mindset and soft skills training and have three presentations. David McKinsey from the World Bank Group will share with us an overview of what we're learning through the research on such training programs. We're gonna hear from Jacob Wears from Doways on how, what it takes to implement personal initiative training. And then finally, a lecture and presentation from Michael Fries, the co-creator of personal initiative training on what scaling up psychological preparedness for entrepreneurial actions looks like. We'll then move into a panel discussion. We have an exciting list of panelists with like different perspectives on the implementation of both personal initiative and other types of training programs. And through all of this, we will filter in your questions and uh, try to answer them either through the chat or through our webinar today. So let's get started. Lots of content over the next hour and more. And before further ado, let me introduce Carla Peterson, the Scaling Director of IPA, who will tell us more about IPA's Best Bets report and frame and contextualize today's webinar with an IPA's broader strategy. Over to you, Carla. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, and it's a real pleasure for me to be here with all of you today and share this very in uh, interesting initiative that IPA just launched, which is um, Best Bets, the Emerging Opportunities for Impact at Scale. So first, I would like to start with a little bit about the motivation behind this new initiative that IPA has launched. And it has to do with the fact that the last 20 years have witnessed a very significant increase in the creation of policy-relevant evidence. So this graph uh, comes from a report from um, uh, uh, from um, this working group that deals with evidence to policy. And what we see is just an example of how, in, how fast the number of impact evaluations has grown in the past 20 years. 
And yet what we see is that the number of evidence-based pro evidence programs that are actually operating at scale is still relatively small. So we're calling these established innovations, that is innovations that are well known, that have proven to be successful and that are already operating at scale. And the list is very short. We have the usual suspects such as bet nets, cash transfers, graduation, teaching at the right level and structure pedagogy. But there is a lot of interest in investing in other uh, evidence-based interventions that could address other challenges that people in poverty face and where evidence is required to understand what works and how. And so here we have some quotations of some in, um, important funders that speak about the need of identifying what these new innovations are and investing in bringing them to scale. But then the question becomes, how do we know where to invest next? That is, how do we know uh, what interventions hold the most promise for becoming the next generation of established innovations that can be implemented effectively at scale. So how do we go from identifying out of this larger pool of proof of concept innovations that keeps growing, which ones are the ones that have the highest potential to become the next generation of established innovations. And so this is a challenge that IPA took at hand. IPA is committed to discovering and advancing exactly what works to improve the lives of people living in poverty. And so what we did is that we took on this challenge and leveraged our sectoral experts and scientific advisors to go over hundreds and hundreds of studies and classify them along the path to scale. So in this effort, we identified 50 approaches that are in different stages of this path to scale. So at the bottom of the path, we have the proof of concept innovations. So interventions or policies that have been rigorously evaluated using RCTs and that demonstrate their success in achieving expected results in a specific context. We then have exploratory innovations. So these are innovations that have limited or maybe conflicting evidence across a broader range of contexts and that require further research to understand their effectiveness, the target population, and what are the implementation conditions that lead to their success. We then have emerging innovations, where there is stronger evidence that suggests that these innovations work across contexts. There is some partner support in moving them forward, but there are some questions that remain around the scalability, the cost effectiveness, and the delivery. And finally, as I was mentioning, we have the established innovations, which are well-known interventions that have proven to be successful across different contexts and that are already operating at scale. So we use a range of criteria starting from what the evidence said, but also scalability factors to rank these interventions across the path to scale. And what we realize is that research and partnership activities are required to move all these interventions from proof of concept to impact at scale. So the types of questions that we face at each of these stages are very different. In the case of exploratory innovations, what we need to understand a little bit better is if this, a similar impact would hold at, uh, across different contexts and by different implementers, we require partnership support to expose implementing partners and potential funders to these programs and addressing the questions that they have. In the case of emerging innovations, we still have questions around cost benefit, delivery, and long-term impact, spillover effects, among others. And partnership activities are also required to identify additional scaling partners and funding sources. And even for established innovations, there's a set of interesting questions around improving program delivery, and also building coalitions of partners to bring these interventions uh, to mass scale. And what we will be focusing in this uh, initiative of Best Bets is our emerging innovations. And the reason is that we think these are the best bets for future opportunities for impact at scale. So that means that these are the innovations that hold the most promise for becoming uh, emer established innovations in the future. So to delve a little bit more into this definition, let me walk you through what we think are uh, best bets. So as I was mentioning, best bets are the interventions that hold the most promise for making an impact at scale. And this is defined by the fact that there's strong evidence, so evidence of effectiveness that is supported by different studies in different contexts, the size of the impact or the wide-reachedness of the impact, 
but also other scalability factors. So for instance, the fact that these have a reasonable cost compared to alternative interventions and that cost does not represent a barrier to scaling, the ease of implementation, and the existence of funders and other implementing partners that are engaged and might be ready to take these interventions to scale. But at the same time, these interventions still have additional research and policy development questions that need to be addressed to make sure that we can actually take these interventions to scale in a cost-effective way. So some examples of these are cost-effectiveness, uh, so trying to lower costs and optimize the intervention, questions around delivery, for instance, how to make the intervention more standardized, simplify the intervention for government delivery, improve in targeting, using digital resources, adding complementary interventions, and also questions around impact. So for instance, questions about the external validity of the interventions, if there have other spillover effects, how they vary across um, the population and also the long-term effects of these interventions. So using these criteria, we identified 14 best bets, again, leveraging our sectoral expertise and academic network that span across a very wide range of sectors. So we have some around nutrition, education, social protection, education, um, environment and climate, and of course, entrepreneurship and private sector development. And so today we will be focusing on one of these best bets, which is soft skills training to boost business profits and sales. So what are we defining as soft skills training? It's a training curriculum that teaches participants to develop a proactive entrepreneurial mindset, encouraging them to consistently seek new opportunities, learn from errors, and think of ways to differentiate their business from others. So using our best bets um, framework, what we see is that there is strong evidence that suggests that these interventions work and that they can have a big impact. But some questions still remain about how to lower costs. So the range of costs of these uh, interventions is very wide. How to improve delivery, for instance, how to identify participants that would benefit most from these kinds of interventions, how to leverage, for instance, online delivery if possible, what complementary interventions should or could be added on top of soft skills training to increase impact, and defining a scalable model. And again, some very interesting partnership activities related to this best bet around identifying implementing partners that could take this to scale at a global level, and also identifying implementation funding to scale these interventions, but also invest in answering the pending questions that we have identified as part of this best bet. So at the core, Best bet is an invitation for coalitions of implementers, researchers, and funders to capitalize on existing knowledge of what works, to address some of the world's most pressing problems, but at the same time to invest in answering the remaining questions as we scale these interventions. And what role will IPA play in moving best bets forward? Our role will vary depending on the best bet. What we want to do is build coalitions that we can support and move forward these interventions depending on what is required for each of the best bets and what other partners in the broader ecosystem are doing to move them forward. So at the lowest uh, touch of the spectrum, what we will do is help gather and disseminate the evidence around these best bets. So what do we know about these best bets, how they work and how they can be taken to scale. And depending on the support needed, we will also provide research support, so identifying replication opportunities and testing these innovations at scale. Expanding our partnership network to identify opportunities to implement these interventions and learn from what we're implementing. Provide technical assistance to make sure that the implementation is being done the right way and with fidelity to the evidence. And also support fundraising efforts to replicate these best bets, but also to make sure that once they're proven effective, they can be implemented at scale with fidelity to the evidence. So this is just a quick introduction to this very exciting initiative. And this webinar is an example of a series of webinars that we will be hosting in which we will be zooming in into some of these best bets, making sure that we disseminate what we know about them, but also inviting broader coalitions of partners and funders in exploring the questions that still need to be addressed. And so we have a great lineup of speakers to delve into these questions for soft skills training. And if you want to learn more, please reach out. Uh, the link to the report is here on the slides. You can also reach out to me if you want to learn more about best bets and how you can collaborate with IPA. 
and follow us on social media to learn more about how this initiative moves forward and other upcoming events. I'll give it back to you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Carla. That was that was the you know that was an introduction to to uh, soft skills training for you know why we're focusing on this topic today. Uh, I'm very excited that up next we have David McKinsey, who is the who is the lead economist from like the World Bank Group and researcher on several of these relevant evaluations on entrepreneurial mindset training programs for business growth. So I'm going to pass it on to David and we're very excited to hear from you. Over to you, David. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so yeah, thanks, everyone. It's a, a pleasure to give this overview here. And so um, I wanted to just uh, sort of start by saying that, you know, this is really, you know, building on uh, and, and based on a lot of work that that was developed by Michael Fries and his team, who you're going to hear from later. But I was asked to sort of give a broader overview of what we've been learning about different approaches to um, building skills in small firms and uh, the role of soft skills in that. And so, you know, let me start by differentiating, you know, a, a sort of crude um, division into hard skills and soft skills. And so, we, you know, often when we think about providing skills to business owners, we think about, uh, you know, hard skills in terms of business or management practices, things like how to keep records, how to do marketing, how to make a budget, controlling your inventory, or if we start looking at larger firms, you know, quality controlling, manufacturing practices, things like that. And these practices are really important. We see that firms that do more of these are more productive, they're more likely to survive, they grow faster over time. And so not surprisingly, a lot of standard training and consulting have focused on trying to improve these types of skills in firms. And those, those programs have had some success. Uh, when we do a meta-analysis, it seems like for you know, micro and small firms, there's a 5% increase in sales or a 12% increase in profits from those programs. The tricky thing is that, that it's quite hard to teach those skills to these um, firms in the amount of time that you typically have for a training. Yeah, every and, and so while these are useful practices, trying to get firms to adopt everything at once is very difficult. And you know, there was there's a question about whether this is all that's needed or whether some other things are needed to really create successful entrepreneurs. And so that's where this the sort of set of other skills comes in, um, which are sometimes dubbed soft skills, which are really focusing on entrepreneurial attitudes, mindsets, the aspirations for growth. And you know, when we talk about pro um personal initiative, then we're thinking about being proactive, looking not to do the same thing over and over again, being resilient. If we have an error, how can we make sure that doesn't happen again and learn from that? And then there's a number of other types of uh, soft skills that I'll talk about as well that are also inspired by psychology. So just to give you an example, you know, of the difference in what training might look like with these two, this is from a study I'm about to talk about in Togo. But, you know, if you're doing traditional business training, a lot of your exercises might look like this one, which I apologize is in French, but this is um, in looking at a bakery and you say, okay, let's look at the, um, this bakery and think about the ingredients that you use and the, the costs that you have. And then let's think about, you know, how much does it cost to make um, your bread? What's the unit costs of that? Let's, you know, think about, um, you know, where um, our, we, we can make savings by budgeting. Let's make sure we understand, you know, what are our most important products to be um, selling, where there's opportunities for, for better marketing of these products, et cetera. And so it's really focused on sort of a set of um, business skills that are um, sort of textbook almost that you might go through if you're in a university and doing a, an accounting course or in a marketing course. Uh, in contrast, an exercise in this personal initiative training might say, you know, let's look at what your day looks like. You know, what did yesterday look like? Well, you know, you opened your store, you waited for your customers to come, you know, someone showed up, you didn't have, um, you know, the thing that they were looking for, you sent them down the street, you, you know, you had your usual supplier come by, some usual, you know, chatting with friends, and then at the end of the day, you, you look, and it's not that great a day. And so then the exercise is, let's look through every point in that day, what could we do so that tomorrow doesn't look exactly the same? What can I do so that I'm doing something different and I'm not just repeating the same thing over and over again? How can I differentiate myself from, from that? How can I sort of be more, more proactive and wait instead of just waiting for things to come to me, um, looking for those opportunities? And so you know, similarly with finances, you know, I, 
if, if a bank doesn't work, let's think about a whole range of different op opportunities where I can be proactive, I can bootstrap myself, I can you know, really um, not wait for things to come to me. And so we, um, I, I had seen Michaels and his team do a pilot of this, and this is sort of talking about how the best bets emerge. They'd done a sort of small pilot study of this in Uganda that looked promising. And so then when a World Bank team was looking to work with the government in, in Togo, we thought, let's, let's really try and do this at a larger scale and compare it to the type of traditional training that is typically done in these programs. And so they had 1,500 firms applying to this government program in Togo. They're the typical sort of small firms with two or three employees across a whole range of different industries. Um, you know, they're, they're not the very micro subsistence firms. They're sort of earning um, you know, a mean and a, of $200 a month in profits or a median of 84. So these are already bigger than the sort of one person, um, a dollar a day type firms, but they're still pretty small firms. You know, they've got a bit of education and, and a half for men and half for women. So, you know, this is important for understanding whether these programs work differently for, for men or women. And what we did was we randomized these, these 1,500 firms into three groups. And so one group was our control group that didn't get the training. And then we had one group that went through this traditional type of business training and one group that went through the, the, this personal initiative training that was really focused on self-starting behavior, innovation, being proactive, thinking about these new opportunities, et cetera. And so in both of these, you, you had sort of classroom training that was relatively extensive, three half days a week for four weeks, so 36 hours in the classroom, followed up by these one um, once a month in-person visits where somebody came and helped you um, think about how to apply what you've done in your, in your business and check to see whether you were really doing it. So these were relatively costly because of you know, these follow-up visits and, and uh, um, you know, having all this time in the classroom but there was sort of about similar cost of about $700 per firm. And like a lot of these trainings, they were offered for a very nominal um, price. And so most firms that we offered this to who had applied for this program, took it up sort of 84% in both groups. And most of them attended most of these sessions. And so, you know, firms came along, they attended these sessions. And what did we see? Well, the personal initiative training increased the firm's profits by 30% over two and a half years. Um, compared to just 11% for this traditional type of training, which was not actually statistically significant. And so the personal initiative training was having three times the impact of what had been traditionally been done with, with just trying to teach firms how to keep records, how to do marketing, et cetera. And, you know, we estimated that it paid for itself within a year. And so this was, um, you know, very exciting. The, this got a lot of um, attention and, and lots of other World Bank projects tried to take it up. Um, you know, one of the questions that we always have is, is this something that sustains? And so we've just recently been back to do a seven-year follow-up. And what we see is, even though some of these firms have failed, of course, over uh, seven years, there's been a difficult context with COVID and other um, things. If you look here, personal initiative is the, the crimson or the, the red um, bars. It, in 2013, um, at baseline, they had the same as the control, which is this light blue and, and about the same as the traditional training. This is before we've done any training. Everyone's got the same level of profits. The two years of what I've, I've just been telling you about where the personal initiative is doing better than traditional training or, or control. And if we look seven years later, seven years later, the firms that went through this personal initiative training are still earning about $100 more um, per month um, than the control group. And so remember this training cost about $750. And even seven years later, they're earning $100 more per month or $1,200 more per year. Um, so this is really sort of cost effective and, and value for money in terms of having sustained impacts on, on uh, these firms. And so, you know, this result in Togo, um, you know, shows that there was, when this is done well, it can have big impacts that can last a long time. There's been a number of other studies of this personal initiative, which are a little bit more mixed. Uh, as I said, the early study in, in Uganda that was done with a smaller sample had a large increase in sales. It seemed um, promising, which was what led us to do this in Togo. A couple of studies um, having seen our work in Togo tried to implement this in Ethiopia and in, in Jamaica. And you know, neither of them found significant impacts, although the, impact, the estimates are quite noisy. And there were suggestions that the quality of the trainers could be a big issue. And this is sort of one of the things that we'll talk about in scale up is how do you ensure this is done 
um, at, at, at good quality as you start trying to take to other contexts. There's There's been many other um, attempts to, to try and do this where the results are not yet out in the public domain and some of them have sort of been deciding whether you offer this to different groups or whether you mix the personal initiative training with a bit of the hard skills training, should you have a bit of both? Um, you know, early evidence in Mexico seemed to show some positive impacts. Um, you'll hear from the doorways team, um, I think about, uh, or from Michael about work that's been done with the World Bank with farmers in Mozambique where they got a mix of this personal initiative training and agricultural training that seems to have been very successful. I've been working at one attempt in, in uh, Ecuador to try and do this at scale where we delivered training to 50,000 people um, and high school students sort of using an online um, training self-paced approach. And this does seem to increase personal initiative, but there's no increase in entrepreneurship. And it seems to be a sort of, you know, this is one of the challenges with, with doing it with, with students is it takes a long time for them to finish school and they need to have opportunities where they can do it. And far fewer of them are doing any type of work yet than we had thought. And so maybe it's just too early to, to look there. And so, um, you know, the, I think the Togo work is, is the strongest showing when this is well implemented, um, this can do, but there's a number of other studies that are, are starting to find some impacts as well. So, um, in this uh, Vox Dev Lit, which I um, had shared in the, the link where we try and look and across the studies, the studies that actually have you know, academic papers out right now with estimates that um, are in the public domain, if we look across sort of a range of soft skills or psychological training approaches, we are getting on average a 14% increase in profits, but there's a lot of variability amongst studies and um, even a lot of uncertainty within studies around um, Th that and so this is one of the things where we you know still need more research and more precision by by working with sort of taking this to scale and working working with larger samples. So you know we're going to focus on personal initiative training um, in in most of the session, but I wanted to just note that there's there's a number of other approaches that are trying to use other psychological skills, and so one is uh, thinking about interpersonal skills and how you react and, and work with other businesses and, and with customers. And so, um, you know, there's, there's been work in Liberia that focuses on how do you communicate with customers, build customer trust, you know, that type of relationship building um, skills. Um, similarly in Togo, uh, in, in another study um, completely separate from ours, thinking that, you know, firms don't know how to work well with their peers and they might not actually need help um, to, to learn how to interact. Then there's sort of work on, you know, building that aspirations by how do you view your um, future? Can you imagine your future sort of teaching through imagery or through the sort of growth mindset that's been taught in, in education, you know, thinking about, um, you know, related in, to personal initiative in terms of, you know, how to learn from failure, how, you know, knowing that that's not the end, that you can grow, that, you know, challenging problems are, are things that, that are really learning opportunities. And so, you know, there's, there's early work on that. I should say most of these other things are not nearly in the same category as the personal initiative in terms of having um, long-term evidence. They're, they're, they're sort of lots of little promising things where you look over, you know, six months or a year and there seems to be something but nothing where we can sort of say, this is being done in a number of contexts and it's been done where we see evidence that, that shows these impacts can last for a while. So th there's encouraging things again, to say that the psychological approaches uh, are useful, but um, you know, we, we, we don't have nearly the same sort of strength of evidence as we do for personal initiative. And then, you know, you know pers the personal initiative training has really been focused on existing businesses and trying to get existing businesses to grow um, better. But then there's also, you know, a big target group for a lot of um, audiences in terms of working with youth or with people trying to start a business. And there's been a number of programs that try and look at, you know, what should you be teaching um, young people who are trying to get into business of, of starting a business. And so there's been interesting work in Uganda um, by, by a team from Berkeley that sort of tried to teach a mini MBA program where they had a mix of hard and soft skills. And the soft skills there are sort of negotiation, grit, perseverance, you know, related a bit to some of the parts of personal initiative, but, you know, also focused more on the, some of this negotiation um, side. And they sort of randomized whether you get a lot of hard skills and a little bit of soft skills or a lot of soft skills and uh, um, uh, 
a little bit of hard skills, and then they track these youth for three and a half years, and they find you know, that, that people have gone through this program are more likely to be running their own businesses and they're earning higher profits and incomes compared to a very low base where people aren't um, doing very much. But they can't reject, you know, 75% soft skills versus 25% soft skills ha seems to have the sort of same impacts in, in their studies. And so it's, you know, this, this optimal mix is still an open question. And then I think Michael will talk a little bit more about this, but he's been working on this sort of program that he calls um, STEP that combines this mix of hard skills, you know, rules of thumb for major content areas on marketing, financial management, with these soft skills on um, personal initiative, but also creativity, opportunity identification, dealing with customers, some of the things we've seen before. Um, and they, you know, they have been putting together a, a range of these randomized trials. There's, there's not um, a, a, a paper that you can go and look up yet, but he'll show you some of the, the results. Um, and, uh, you know, that seems promising as well. I think one of the big challenges with youth is that, you know, often many of them are at the stage where they're doing many things, they're continuing to study, the time frame that you need to look at impact can be quite long, but then often a lot of these businesses that are started by youth also fail at very high rates, and so it's not clear, you know, what success looks like, and should we be having people start businesses when they're 20, or is it better for them to go into education, and should they be, you know, starting businesses when they're they're, they're 30. Um, and then, you know, one of the challenges we faced in Ecuador with doing this with youth is if many of them are not going to end up running businesses, should you try and teach just business skills to youth or should you try and teach skills that are also very applicable in, in, in wage work, uh, or, you know, planning, communication, negotiation skills, or should it really be entrepreneurship focused? So to, you know, in, in terms of, you know, where I think we stand or what we still need to know, you know, we've got this promising evidence. We've got, you know, sh had, have these studies that shown, um, show that some, that including some of these psychological based training approaches and particularly personal initiative can work. But, you know, what we still need to know is, you know, what's the right curricula is, is do we, you know, there's a whole mix of different soft skills and psychological concepts. They're often interrelated. It's not clear which skills are most important from, most groups, you know, we have these sort of heuristics that, um, you know, when we go into MBA classes, we're not teaching them to, um, you know, necessarily be uh, doing some of the, the most basic, uh, or oh, you can learn from your failures and you can be proactive, but, you know, we're teaching them sort of how to be a leader and how to negotiate um, and, and less on self-efficacy. But then when we work with smaller firms, we want to really focus on them having these dreams and these aspirations and being proactive. There's this question of, you know, should we only have soft skills or should we have a mix of hard and soft or, you know, does putting a little bit of everything dilute the focus on, on core psychological concepts? Is it better to, to, to concentrate? And then one of the, you know, key things is sort of how much active learning you can incorporate in these programs. One of the things in Togo and in, in a lot of the personal initiative programs is to really have an active project where you can immediately put into action um, the, the concepts you're learning and try those out. But then, you know, what does that mean if you're trying to teach this in, in a con context where people maybe don't have those opportunities straight away to, to put those in, in, in action or should we only target those who, who can? Then, you know, I talked a little bit about quality. We still need to learn about, you know, what makes for a good trainer and other types of people that are good at tr teaching hard skills that are often in these government training institutes, maybe not the right people to be teaching soft skills. And you know, how can we make this plug and play where there's an off the shelf type of training modules like there are for a lot of the hard skills where a microfinance organization can just pick this up, give it to their, um, you, you know, their, their, their microfinance loan offices and have them use it with their clients. You know, that's the goal that we'd like to get to, I think, where it's just you know, really easy for any organization that wants to use this to, to use this. And we're not quite there yet. Um, you know, and that's really, you know, how can we scale this up? So we're delivering it to 10,000, 100,000 people and we maintain the quality without it getting really expensive. So, you know, clearly online training seems like it might have some potential there, but, you know, there's a lot of questions about can you maintain the intensity and the, the, the quality when you do that? Um, and then similarly, if, if, it, if it really works to the extent that we, we sort of are finding that it does in Togo where, you know, seven, even seven years later, um, you know, this training is, is earning such high returns. Can we get people to pay for this training? 
Um, this is something that we've piloted a bit in Jamaica and in trying to learn for the, you know, what the demand is, but can we really, you know, use some sort of system where people at least are, are paying or paying back some of it, um, or, you know, if it has such high returns. And so, you know, this gets to the final point is, you know, what types of training do we need for what types of firms? You know, how should we target this? Which size firm is really too big for this type of training? Are there entrepreneurs who we you know, look at and say they're really proactive enough? Personal initiative should not be for them. You know, um, what's, you know, what should we be doing for owners who are going into accelerators or for owners of 25 person firms versus the sort of, you know, two, three person firms or the, the sole entrepreneurs that are, you know, so prevalent in developing countries, but perhaps not where a lot of the job growth is going to come from. In the end. So let me stop there and um, yeah, happy to answer questions later. Thanks. Thank you so much, David. Uh, David is very kindly offered to answer any specific questions that might be there on his presentation in the chat. So do put your questions in the chat and we'll also pull some up for later in the in the agenda as well. And now for all of you wondering, what does it take to implement personal initiative training? Here with us is Jacob Wears from Doorways. Doorways is an organization started out of Lifana University and um, with the aim of adapting personal initiative training to different contexts. So uh, Jacob is gonna get into some of the considerations to you know, keep in mind when you want to implement such a training program. Over to you, Jacob. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Elizabeth. And thank you, David. Um, let me quickly share my screen. Um, and start the presentation. All right. Okay, so uh, good morning, uh, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, my name's Jacob, I'm from the NGO Doorways, as introduced um, a spin-off of Leuphana University and part of the team uh, that has been doing research on specifically the um, PI training. And in the next uh, yeah, 10 to 12 minutes, I'm trying to give you a bit of an overview of what we know um, is important for implementing um, such interventions like the personal initiative training. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, uh, just a very brief uh, overview of the topics. I'm going to briefly introduce the concept of personal initiative. We've already heard the name uh, quite, quite a lot, uh, but what does personal initiative actually mean? Um, what are the mechanics of the training? Um, we've heard that it's an action-oriented training, but what does, does that really mean? Um, and then the main focus of the presentation will be on general implementation considerations and highlighting um, as well some scaling issues that arise from it and questions that um, from our perspective, from an implementing perspective, still need to be answered regarding the training. Um, yeah, so what is personal initiative? Um, personal initiative is um, uh, defined as a self-starting, future-oriented and persistent mindset and is shown to be um, important for entrepreneurial success because um, it involves looking for ways to differentiate one's business from others anticipate problems, better um, overcome setbacks and uh, foster better pl planning for opportunities and long-term uh, preparation. So it really consists of three main facets, which is being self-starting. Um, being self-starting means uh, actively searching for evaluating and pursuing opportunities without waiting for others to do it or tell you what to do. But it's not just that it's not just being active, but it's specifically trying to be different, um, finding new ways of doing things, finding new solutions um, to existing problems. Uh, the second aspect is being future oriented, uh, which refers to scanning for potential opportunities and threats in the future, but again, entailing a action component, because it's not just thinking about the future, but it's rather um, starting to prepare for future opportunities and threats in the present. Um, and lastly, um, personal initiative also entails being persistent in overcoming barriers, um, which means protecting one's goals and adapting the plans to overcome problems across the way instead of uh, giving up or changing, uh, changing goals immediately. And it also entails actively dealing with problems instead of giving up. 
Now, the PI training, um, as we've heard, is a soft skills training, and it focuses on fostering a proactive entrepreneurial mindset, uh, which, as mentioned, consists of uh, those three facets. And what we've seen, if done correctly, which is what I'm going to, to talk about later, how to do that, um, can lead to entrepreneur to increased entrepreneurial success. And we've seen in the study of to in Togo that was mentioned that um, the training led uh, to, to various explanatory mechanisms like improved business practices, capital and labor inputs increased through the training, um, innovation, diversification of business, um, of business lines, which ultimately led um, to the increases that um, we've seen in David's presentation. Now, there is on the one hand a difference in the content uh, between hard skills and soft skills training, um, but uh, maybe um, as importantly, there's also a difference in the approach to how the trainings need to be done. And what we are using for the PI training is an action-oriented training. And to design an action-oriented training, there are five core principles um, that we follow for the trainings. The first thing is that through the training, uh, we want to create an action-oriented mental model, which uh, means that um, the participants need to acquire action-relevant knowledge through action principles, so breaking down um, what they need to know into easily applicable rules of thumb. Um, action training also always focuses on learning by doing. Um, so the training combines knowledge acquisition with direct actions through um, case studies, through, um, through exercises within the training. What is equally as important is that those action principles need to be transferred, which is why we are spacing out sessions over time. Um, where what the trainees learn within the sessions, what they are practicing in the exercises is directly applied to the businesses. Um, and between the sessions, they are applying those, um, those things that they've learned to the business. They make errors, they uh, try it out, they come back um, and they try to learn from those errors, share, um, the feedback that they have through the application and uh, learn from their mistakes and each other's mistakes. And then the last point that uh, is important for an action-oriented training uh, is routinization. Um, that means actively practicing and repeating actions to, through the training. So in general, the training is focused not as much as traditional trainings on acquiring or learning about a specific technique as much as it is about practicing it, um, which also means that sessions for the PI training are very interactive with a focus on exercises and feedback. And the message that we are trying to convey to the trainers um, that, that we are working with is the best trainers are the ones who talk the least, um, but rather help the trainees uh, to experience it themselves. Now, the core things that we found out um, over the time of implementing these trainings that are that there are several aspects that need to be considered for a successful training implementation of an action-oriented training. Um, and that is one, suitable training materials, um, two, qualified trainers, and three, fitting and well-equipped um, implementing organizations. And I'm going to briefly talk about um, what we know there and why those things are important. Now, suitable training uh, materials are uh, important because the uh, target groups for the trainings are very flexible. There are different target groups that the training can help. We've already heard that the age ranges are, um, are high. It could be for, for younger people, it could be for older people. Um, and we've done the PI training for very different uh, target groups. Um, so for example, in Togo and small scale traders and 
um, around the world uh, with, with different small scale business owners and MSMEs. Um, we've done um, what, what David was also mentioning. Uh, we've done the, uh, the training uh, with, with farmers. We are uh, working together with, with FAO um, for training for agripreneurs and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, there are different target groups for these types of interventions. And all of these different target groups require um, partially different, uh, different training materials and they need to be adjusted accordingly. Um, there's also the possibility to combine the training, um, either both the trainings that, that we are doing as part of the, of the FRESE group, the PI training and the STEP training, um, which we've done in, in Mozambique um, very successfully for female farmers. Um, but also there, uh, the training materials and the concepts need to be adjusted in case we are combining the training with uh, other interventions. Um, and the training methodology and the concept of personal initiative are also highly relevant for other training programs. And there, the uh, concepts uh, cannot be copied one to one, but it needs to be adjusted to the specific context. So there is, um, from our experience, there is no one size fits all solution to any training. Um, for all of the trainings, the underlying uh, methodology, the core content and training design elements stay the same, but there is a need uh, to adjust the training materials in terms of complexity, depending on the target group, um, to address specific needs and problems that the target group faces. So for example, we've been doing, um, we've just finished a pilot with uh, the PI training for, um, for Rohingya refugees in, in Bangladesh, where the target group is mostly um, or basically exclusively illiterate. So that has some implications for adjusting the target, uh, the materials for the training, um, as well as that it's important to adjust the storylines and examples in the training materials to match the cultural background and the realities of the trainees. Um, and as I mentioned, the training, it's, it's also uh, possible to integrate the training into existing curricula or add additional components. We are currently doing that with the, with the IFC um, in Egypt in a financial literacy program. Now, one key learning uh, that, um, that is important is, uh, is trainer quality. And we've already heard uh, that uh, there are some challenges around that. Um, so we have had interventions in the past uh, that did not yield the same benefits as uh, the most successful implementations um, because, um, and that is our suggestion, uh, our, um, yeah, uh, our idea um, is that um, it is really key to have um, high quality trainers who deliver the training. Um, that is especially the case for these types of interventions that are not just lecture-based interventions. So it's important to choose the fitting trainer candidates um, and to qualify them. Um, and what we are doing there and what we would su suggest for the PI training um, is to have a TOT approach. Um, so a training of trainer approach where you qualify um, with just uh, one or two master trainers, a number of, uh, of local trainers and uh, ideally help them in the early stages of the implementation. Now, once those trainers are qualified, um, it's important to note that it's not that, um, that it's not, uh, it, you can scale it up relatively easily and quickly. Um, so I brought you this example from Burkina Faso um, in a project with the World Bank, um, where the goal was to train 1,600 small scale traders um, in a 10 week program. Um, so within just one TOT, um, those 13 trainers are able to train up to um, uh, more than 1,500 trainees within 10 weeks. So uh, with one TOT, you can reach a relatively large number of, uh, of trainees. And lastly, for the implementing organizations, um, there's really no answer to what type of organization you need. There are tons of different um, possible implementation partners, and it really depends on the specific target group that you're looking into. Um, so it could be public sector organizations. You see a couple of examples there uh, that we've been working with, as well as private sector organizations. And uh, what is important um, 
for finding the right implementation organization is that they are established organizations in a sense that uh, there is also uh, the idea that those um, organizations will continue to exist and continue to provide the training to, um, to a large enough uh, audience that they are capable of recruiting and managing trainees and trainers and the training logistics and have ideally access to the necessary infrastructure. Now, from our perspective, um, there are uh, a couple of things that, that are really important to be answered uh, for the future and for scaling up this, uh, this training um, and soft skills training in general. Um, and one um, is really um, the trainers and maintaining trainer quality over time. Um, so we have some indications of what, um, what the right trainer candidates are. Um, but there is still a lot of evidence to be um, to be created about what type of trainer um, is is really the um, the most successful one, um, and um, we also um, need to address the issue of identifying additional master trainers in a network of master trainers across the world that can um, train a larger number of trainers. Um, then um, something that we've we've touched upon the training is very cost effective if done correctly but there's still um, the issues surrounding um, funding for scaling because most of the target group are not able to pay for the training there's of course room for uh, for different target groups where some may but mostly our target group will not be able to pay for the costs of the training um, so, and there are still recurring costs for paying trainers logistics and maintaining quality over time, even if we were to reduce the costs um, even more. Um, so um, that is something that we need to look into how to sustainably fund the scaling of uh, these types of interventions. Um, and then lastly, some of the approaches for scalability we're thinking about um, is developing and evaluating the effectiveness of digital and hybrid versions of the training. Um, and um, one avenue that we would like to approach more um, is including private sector organizations to a larger extent than we already are doing, um, because we think that those organizations should have an inherent interest in increasing the client's entrepreneurial performance and might be able to, um, to also bear the costs for the scale up um, based on um, on the increase in entrepreneurial profits um, that uh, will occur through those trainings. So yeah, um, that is it from the implementation side from the always. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. We're going to remain in the chat or visit our website if you're interested in the implementation of the training. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jacob. Um, we are, you know, this was very helpful. Uh, moving on, we're moving to Michael Fries, the, the, the co-creator of the personal initiative training. Michael is connecting and joining from Kuala Lumpur, and uh, we are very excited that he's going to provide a broad overview on how we might be able to scale up psychological preparedness in, you know, entrepreneurial, for entrepreneurial actions. Over to you, Michael. You're still on mute, Michael, if you're trying to speak. That's also a problem. Thank you. Uh, so I'm trying to, to get the um, PowerPoint presentation up. Um, and uh, I think I need to, um, uh, I thought I just tried to share, but um, I think it's still a color screen that is being shared at the moment. So um, thank you. Um, so now you should actually be able to. We can see your screen, Michael. Do you see it? Do yes. you see it now? Okay, yes. perfect. Okay, so I want to I want to make a general statement first. The general statement is um, I I believe that PI and the step training uh, can be integrated into macro systems. And uh, we, and in a way, I want to argue um, for that uh, purpose. So um, uh, 
I think uh, you have talked a little bit about the issue of uh, bringing it into the school system. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, we have done uh, one and they are using uh, the step training now uh, curriculum. Uh, but I also think that banks should, uh, uh, should be encouraged to combine microcredits uh, together with something like uh, the step or the uh, PI training. And so this would be the kind of thing that I want to argue. Now, obviously, uh, uh, as, as David already showed, it's not always so easy that it works. We don't always know exactly uh, which type of subgroups uh, it actually works best. Um, and uh, uh, Togo, Mexico, and Mozambique are the three areas where it where we actually showed the clearest effects of personal initiative training. Um, but the step training actually is a bit more robust in my view. Uh, we have used it now in seven countries and about 18 universities. And uh, there we typically have BA students, so a somewhat more educated group. And uh, the BA students are encouraged to uh, start a business and here, the dependent variable becomes, do you start a business or do you not? And then the secondary uh, dependent variable is whether you're actually um, uh, doing well in your business or not doing well. But remember, we first want to actually get more people to start the business. And so the difference is about 33% across, um, across two years. Um, and it's relatively consistent that we get at least some uh, um, uh, uh, effect on business ownership. Now they're often hybrid owners. So they often have a job and have a business. So that is also important to know that we don't always get people to only have, uh, have a business. Their total income is about 10% higher than in the control group, again, across the two uh, year period where we have enough data to actually show that. Now. There is, of course, a problem with finding people again. So it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller the longer we, we're doing the study. And so again, the Togo example is an out, outlier in, in the sense of actually being able to find a seven year um, success rate. Um, but this is so, so the step training, which is uh, the same pedagogy that, um, that uh, Jacob just described and which uh, uses a strong action-oriented approach to the start a company on the first day of the training. Um, and uh, in this way, we actually get people to really uh, be uh, in the mindset of understanding what entrepreneurship is. And uh, we already talked about that trainers need to be better. Now I'll talk a little bit about the mix and match kind of idea. The mix and match idea sort of sounds so plausible, particularly if you think of soft and hard skills, why not mix the two? The problem is that they are sometimes contradictory. So the narrative is sometimes contradictory in terms of, a, of, a, of, a, of the hard skills sort of, uh, let's, let's talk about how we get money, how we get, can actually use the money more effectively and efficiently, et cetera is somewhat different to the kind of soft skill that we teach in personal initiative training and also in the, in the step training. Um, so uh, the narratives may be to some extent contradictory. And then uh, at least in, in Jamaica, we saw that it didn't work at all. So there was no effect whatsoever if you mix the two. Um, in, in Mozambique, where the, where the question was not, hard skill was a soft skill in the business arena, but where it was the hard skill in the arena of, of planting plants and, and taking care of them, and the soft skill was in the area of business, there it worked much better to actually mix and match. So we, we haven't really solved the problem yet. Uh, we're currently doing the, a big study in, in the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and there we will, for the first time, see whether the mixing of uh, giving money and investments 
and personal initiative actually has a positive effect. I was for a long time in Ivory Coast this year to understand how we can sort of think in terms of the macro political sphere and get the, uh, the bottom up kind of processes. And in a way, my, my thinking now is uh, macro meets micro. Uh, so uh, so we, we need to have a fit between what a, what, a, what a country can do in terms of an ecosystem of an entrepreneur ecosystem of making it easy that you start a business and making it uh, potentially interesting and also supporting it. And at the same time producing, and this is what I, what, what my thinking is now, and please look at the middle side, uh, the, the hinge um, to get some kind of psychological preparedness for entrepreneurial actions. So we need something like a key and, uh, and a lock. Uh, the, the, this sort of ma macro approach is very useful, but of course, in the end of the day, you need somebody who is, act who is actually doing it, yeah? who is actually uh, using the actions of an entrepreneur. And he needs to be prepared or she needs to be prepared to actually use all these nice things that are, that are done by politics uh, to, to actually make it easier and more attractive. And this is where the step and where, where the person initiative training comes in to actually prepare people for entrepreneurial actions. Now, you know already all of this. Um, therefore, I'm not gonna repeat what peer person initiative is, but I do want to say we have at least one a uh, little set of data, which is, uh, which is hot off the press, uh, quite, uh, I, I got it uh, yesterday, um, uh, the, where, we, where we could show that uh, step training worked in the high school arena. And Jacob described how we did that with a, with a, uh, uh, with a general overview for, for master trainers, and then uh, more and more people were trained by by, by these master trainers. And at the end of the day, they then went out into the high schools and trained uh, high school students in entrepreneurship. Of course, you don't have an immediate effect. Uh, you need time uh, as uh, David described. And so the time is actually one year afterwards where you see the differentiation between those who went through the training and those who didn't go through the training. But there was a higher degree of ownership again and the important thing for us at first is only ownership. Now, later on, of course, we're also interested that they are better or good uh, trainers as well. Um, uh, sorry, that, uh, uh, that they are good um, uh, entrepreneurs as well. So we, we are concerned about whether or not they're, they're, uh, they work positively. But if you just think in terms of, if you get uh, a 30% higher a percentage of actually entrepreneurs, then it's absolutely okay if they're as good as the other ones um, who are naturally become entrepreneurs anyhow. And so therefore I think the step training is an interesting way to think about it. And we do find a small uh, advantage in the kinds of uh, entrepreneurs that come out of the step training. So then the next, of course, the next step is always technology particularly nowadays. And so you always think of how can we use technology? Now, the first approach is obviously to have bigger lectures, to have huge lectures. And we are trying something out in Ivory Coast as well, where a very charismatic speaker is giving a, a three hour lecture interspersed with a three hour um, uh, exercises uh, of PI training. And we want to see it's an RCT. Uh, we want to see whether that actually has the same or similar kinds of effects because we want to reduce the costs of uh, personal initiative training. Um, there is the, the MOOC type of approach that pr produces video material. And uh, one of uh, Mensman's uh, PhD students is working on that. Um, and of course, uh, David was already referring to the mobile phone study that um, uh, where you where you try to uh, really get uh, an enormous amount of Ecuadorians, uh, high school students, and which didn't work. Uh, but 
the problem there is, of course, that the effects are always so terribly small in whenever you are using te uh, new technology for two reasons. One is that people just stop, you know, they, 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 they play around. Uh, once you give them a new technology kind of situation, they play around. Probably some of you are not listening right now, but are answering emails. Um, so, uh, or are looking at the social media. So the one is naturally inclined because that's the function of the social media that they draw you in and they draw you away from, of course, um, a training thing as well. And therefore, everything that's around the, the technology is always complicated. You need some kind of structure, outside structure. So we do have a per person initiative app now. Uh, we have not used it yet. Uh, we also don't believe in it yet, quite frankly, um, uh, because it is, it, it's sort of, you know, it's sort of the same type of thing that we always do when we do face-to-face -face, and it's not yet adapted enough to the new technology, but at least we could use it as a booster, I think. So, um, so we do think that we want to do a bit more of that kind of approach. Um, now, remember, MOOCs have about a five to 10% completion rate, you know, and we're not even talking about whether this has, the, whether this is successful, it's just completion. Um, and the, so the problem then is, how do you scaffold the whole thing so that people actually really stay with it? And you need some kind of scaffolding from the outside, like for example, teachers can be a scaffold for the kind of, uh, of personal initiative training in school. Um, uh, you need some kind of po potential motivational scaffolding, some kind of metacognitive scaffolding, et cetera. Maybe certificates, maybe uh, incentives work as, as scheduling, uh, as, as uh, scaffolding. So all of these kinds of things are, are potentially possible and have not been really done yet. So all the, ideas around microcredit groups, for example, can also be scaffolds for this kind of uh, training that I'm talking about. Now, in general, then, uh, my, my point is we should, we should embrace the possibility that um, the bottom-up process is as important as the uh, top-down process, and that we have to really work on the psychological preparedness. Um, now, how you do psychological preparedness is really then a different issue and an empirical one. And, and I really loved the talk by David uh, where he looked at, at different approaches uh, for the psychological preparedness, but it is what we have to be concerned about. So in the end, of course, I do also think uh, that we have now 300 trainers, certified trainers in personal initiative and in STEP. Um, why the hell can't we get them to actually uh, uh, offer personal initiative training, not in the sense of actually making money on it. Now I understand that, um, that people will not uh, put up 700 or $750 right away at the beginning of a training where they aren't absolutely convinced that it is they who actually make the $700 later on. But we can actually have something like sharing in, in terms of profits. So profit sharing kind of arrangements where you say, you know, whatever you make more in terms of profit, you give me 30% for the next two years um, as a trainer. Uh, and you start out with $10 right now here and there. Um, and so that you actually try different systems of approaches. And I know that the, you, you need honesty, et cetera, et cetera, and all of that, but in principle, it, there, there should be more possibilities also to get uh, people involved to become, uh, to develop uh, institutions. So the general point then is, um, of course we need RCTs, we need uh, RCTs in every one of those areas that we are talking about, but we should match, when we match, we should actually match more the micro and the, than the, uh, the macro and the micro type of approaches then simply the uh, so, sort of hard skill, soft skill kinds of approaches. So the this is my general idea. And I think we, we should be talking about that a bit more 
um, in, in the future. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. I think that was a really good framing for our next discussion, which you know brings together a lot of new new voices here to talk a little bit more focused on scaling, what that looks like. We're very excited to have a you know like a broad range of voices here. Uh, Dr. Anita Shankar from the Self Empowerment and Equity for Change Initiative. This is another training program that is currently being tested. Uh, in the context of entrepreneurs in Uganda. So we're excited Anita is with, here with us today. Salman Alibai from the World Bank, who has the experience of implementing personal initiative training through the World Bank and with local implementing partners with the government. So uh, he's going to be on the panel as well. And then representing Doorways is Benjamin Sharwhite, the co-founder and CEO as well, if you have any questions for Doorways. And I'm going to ask presenters to also raise their hands if they have anything to comment and to, or to add to the discussion. Uh, uh, but we'll, you know, we'll we'll get started with our panel discussion. I'm going to start with you, Salman, and ask you a question on, you know, you have you reflecting on the presentation that you heard and 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 that you've heard today. What what do you see are like key messages you would like to amplify, and also what how does that connect with your own experience implementing personal initiative training in the context of the World Bank and with like government uh, partners? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. And uh, a fascinating set, set of presentations that I think sync together uh, really well. I think one of the key messages that came out to me in these three presentations uh, was, you know, David talked a little bit about this mixing of hard and soft skills as sort of a question uh, for the future. Uh, and thinking about this example of the mini MBA program in Uganda, for example. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and Jacob also touched on this, as, as did Michael. Uh, uh, Michael, when you talked about sort of integrating uh, PI and STEP into macro systems, uh, and and I think you know from our experience, uh, uh, what we did in in Ethiopia was we had a World Bank uh, uh, lending program, a loan program with the government of Ethiopia to support entrepreneurs and specifically women entrepreneurs in the country. Uh, and what we did was we took the personal initiative program uh, and we tried to integrate it into the government's uh, TVET training system for entrepreneurs. Um, and, and I think this was really sort of one of the key learnings is that, you know, uh, taking an approach like personal initiative, taking an approach like soft skills training, I think what seems to be able to make it work is the ability to integrate it into existing systems, to blend it and to mix it with what's already there. Uh, so, you know, when we think about sort of these best bets, things like bed nets, uh, you know, I think there's some of these things that are best bets that are one specific thing, uh, uh, like bed nets. Um, but then there's things like soft skills training and personal initiative, which might look very different in different contexts. Uh, and sometimes it might be valuable to brand them as personal initiative or to brand them uh, as psychological training. In other cases, it might make much more sense to integrate them into systems uh, and curricula that are already there uh, on the ground. Um, so, so I think that was sort of a, you know, something that came up clearly in the presentations uh, and that we've experienced it in a practical way on the ground, uh, as well as really the, the necessity to sort of take this, uh, this innovation uh, and figure out ways to contextualize and blend it with what already exists. Um, and maybe to say briefly about sort of, you know, what happened in Ethiopia uh, when we tried to take uh, soft skills training and personal initiative to scale in a government uh, TVET program. Um, what we did there was we had a target of training about 30,000 entrepreneurs in Ethiopia, and we took the existing uh, TVET system uh, that was providing business training to entrepreneurs in the country, uh, but we developed a PI uh, training course within those TVET colleges. Um, the cost was a very scalable cost. Uh, the cost worked out to about $40 Per participant. Uh, so if you compare that to some of the costs that we saw uh, in the earlier presentations, uh, definitely this was sort of a, a cost level that could be, uh, uh, you know, could be could reach a very large number of uh, beneficiaries uh, and could be affordable within a, a sort of public service delivery program. Um, essentially, I think what we what we found in Ethiopia uh, was that uh, on the surface level. We didn't see uh, at, an, at the aggregate level. We didn't see an impact 
uh, of the personal initiative training or the soft skills training on the growth of these firms or on the sort of psychological uh, variables, uh, sort of on the psychological uh, capacities of, of the trainees. Uh, but when we delved a little bit deeper, what we found is that uh, there was a big impact of trainer quality. So actually, some of the trainees in this group in Ethiopia, uh, of the many thousands that were trained, uh, some of them actually did have a sizable bump in these psychological, uh, in these ways of thinking, uh, and they also had a bump in, in profit and in the growth of their firms. Uh, and we traced that back to the trainers that they had. Um, and so I, I think, uh, uh, you know, Jacob, you all also had this slide on finding the right trainers. And I think that was really sort of a key lesson for us. Um, I, I, we can say a little bit more, I can say a little bit more about kind of maybe later about what finding the right trainer was, was and in this context, what we meant by trainer quality. But, but I think, uh, you know, that was, a, that was a key takeaway. So I think I, I would leave it for now with those two headline uh, uh, observations. One, that it's really about a blend and fitting into local contexts. And the second, that uh, when we think about scale, uh, trainer quality is, uh, is, is, is very critical. I was going to summarize your points, but I'm so glad you summarized them at the end of, you know, uh, that very important uh, points to note. I'm also going to turn now to Anita because Anita has been working with the Sea Change Initiative and, uh, you know, a different approach that is focused on uh, encouraging personal agency. And, you know, it, it borrows from, from public health and it's, it's moving into the entrepreneurship space right now. I'm going to turn over to Anita and, and you know, give you a chance to speak a little bit about your program and, and how it sort of connects with the topic and discussion here, but also which aspects of the presentations that you hear, heard connect for your work as well as you're thinking about how to implement and scale your program in the context of entrepreneurs. Thanks a lot, Elizabeth. And... I agree with Salman. This has been a very interesting and exciting group of um, presentations so far. I'm glad to be part of this conversation. We came to this idea around personal agency from a very different perspective, from the perspective of public health, and have been looking at ways to be able to move people from knowledge to action within these very resource poor settings. Um, and developed the Self-Empowerment and Equity for Change initiative as a result of uh, really focusing on how do we foster personal agency, that is being able to make decisions and take action. And, and personal initiative is grounded on that as well. And I wanted to emphasize that one of the things that Michael had said that this is, we have to think much broader about this concept in general because this gap between knowledge to action is so large for most people, not just for entrepreneurs, but for everyone. And being able to capitalize on our understanding on the, of the psychological um, underpinnings, as well as um, exercises that can help people exp express these um, personal agencies is important. And, and I think it's applicable to a whole range of different um, topic areas, initiatives, as well as, um, uh, you know, sectors. So um, the Self-Empowerment and Equity for Change um, has a number of different open source curricula. We have one that's called the Empowered Entrepreneur Training, which includes um, uh, basic uh, personal agency contact and leadership exercises, as well as basic business training. We also do this within the um, employee space. So it's around... Um, uh, it's called the Empowered Employee Training, and I can also put our link in terms of you can get these uh, open source resource, uh, resources from this link. Now, there's a couple of things that have been expressed here that we've also uh, experienced quite a bit as well. And one is um, uh, the idea of, of trainers. How do we get people to effectively train within this, these contexts? And Personal initiative, personal agency trainings are completely different than any other type of training that we have grown to learn, like either through school, education, universities, et cetera, because it requires a understanding of self. It, under, it requires a willingness to be vulnerable. And the, it, it requires, I think it was Jacob that said that the trainers should speak less and allow participants to experience 
and understand themselves because ultimately the action is only going to happen if the participants actually embody these concepts. So our best trainers, we have about 250 trainers globally, about 25 countries. And the best trainers that we have had are those ones that use personal agency training for themselves. And through that understanding of how difficult it is to go from knowledge to action, they're able to create that safe space for people to um, be able to decide what they want to do and take action. The other thing that I want to emphasize is the role of sociocultural norms and sociocultural context in influence influencing people's um, ability to take action. Um, what we have found is that especially for, for women, um, it's less their uh, uh, knowledge about what to do for their business, but they're struggling with how to manage household um, activities and tasks and being scolded by the mother-in-law. So they can't even leave to do the specific actions that they, that they want to for their businesses. So being able to understand that context is really important. For our training, we have a training of trainer program as well. We use a human-centered design process for trainers to be able to adapt things for the particular exercises for their context. So I'm gonna leave it there because I know we, we wanna make sure we have time for other questions, but. Yeah, thank you. It, I guess the question that I want to broadly pose to Anita and to Salman, and I'm, I, I invite others to, uh, you know, opine on this as well, though it's been captured in some of their presentations. From your point of view, how, what is it that we need by way of partnerships in terms of research, in terms of, you know, uh, to be able to scale some of these programs? From the point of view of scaling, what are sort of the barriers and what are sort of the open questions that we need to resolve, including like the types of partnerships that we need? So I would, you know, I'm going to let uh, maybe Salman, you can go first and then Anita, and then we'll open it up to our broader presenters and panelists as well. Uh, sure. Uh, so we're actually doing some work here in Indonesia uh, where I'm based uh, now uh, uh, that speaks a little bit to this. Um, but maybe, you know, to get into partnerships, one thing maybe to delve into is uh, this question we just talked about, about quality of trainers. Um, and, you know, I think it's kind of important to think about what do we mean by quality of trainers? What do we mean by a high quality trainer? This is something the presentations all uh, hinted at as well. What we found in, in Ethiopia uh, was that, uh, you know, let me start with what training quality isn't. Uh, because what we found in Ethiopia was that the number of years of education uh, that a trainer had uh, and the cognitive abilities, so sort of the IQ of the trainer, didn't have any correlation with the psychological outcomes of the trainees. So what you would typically think of as trainer quality, someone who's experienced, someone who's highly intelligent, someone who you know went to a good school, th those things didn't actually really seem to predict uh, the quality of the trainer. They didn't determine the quality of the trainer. Uh, and, and you know this is kind of consistent what, with I think what we see in education literature broadly, right? Where you know years on the job aren't sort of consistently found to be a correlate with student learning, right? Um, so so this is you know in one sense this isn't that surprising, but what we found in Ethiopia did determine trainer quality. Uh, the one quality that we found which trainers, if they had this quality, they were able to really impact the psychological outcomes of their students was whether that trainer had owned a business themselves or had run a business themselves. So it turned out, you know, when we did this in Ethiopia, about 40% of the trainers uh, in these TVET colleges had actually run a business themselves. And those that had run a business th th themselves were much more influential. They were really able to impact uh, the students and get the students shifting their mindsets and thinking about how to run their own businesses uh, more confidently in a more motivated way, in a more uh, efficient way. And so, you know, when we talk about trainer quality, at least in this this experience, what we what we were talking about is trainers who had run a business before that made them quality trainers. Now, to link that to partnerships, I think you know what what you then see is that you know if what you want to do is get experienced business people, uh, people who have run a business before, maybe you know they have some communications, good communication skills, interpersonal skills, or teaching skills, but essentially you want to get 
existing entrepreneurs or people who have run a business before to train other entrepreneurs or to become trainers. Uh, and I, I think when you look at it from that perspective, uh, it sort of helps understand what sort of partnerships are needed. Um, so you really do need partnerships with the private sector. You need partnerships with entrepreneurs who are willing to be coaches or mentors or trainers. Uh, I think in our experiences, uh, we're running a program with an NGO here in Indonesia uh, where this NGO is bringing in experienced entrepreneurs uh, to provide training and sort of online sessions uh, to newer, younger entrepreneurs uh, across the country. They're doing this online. Uh, and, you know, what we found here in Indonesia was that these experienced entrepreneurs, they can't really deliver a classroom training over two weeks or over a one month period, uh, which is, you know, sometimes how we think about a business training. Uh, that's just not realistic for them. But what they can do is a webinar uh, every, you know, once a month or a couple times a quarter. Um, so, you know, thinking about how can you uh, attract sort of experienced business people uh, to provide this kind of knowledge and training? Uh, and that might sort of then influence the format, you know, things like the apps that Michael was talking about, things like webinars, things like, uh, you know, less frequent, uh, but more qualified trainers uh, might, might sort of be, be ways of uh, uh, thinking about that. So, and then in that sense, I think really the partnerships you're looking for are partnerships uh, with entrepreneurs, partnerships with private sector players uh, that can really uh, take these things uh, uh, out to scale. And, you know, in most cases, these types of entrepreneurs are willing to do this, if not pro bono, I mean, usually for pro, for pro bono, um, or, uh, you know, the, the, the incentive for them isn't, isn't usually financial. So um, I think there's sort of a, a way in this, this can be done very cost effectively uh, as well. Yeah, and I just want to add on, on those points, which I agree with all of those. Um, I think a few things in order to effectively scale, I think we have to stop calling these soft skills. These aren't soft skills. These are foundational human skills that everybody needs to have because and we want people to know that and recognize the value, not only in entrepreneurship and livelihood, but in people's lives. And I think by changing the narrative of how we talk about this is going to open up funders understanding about how important this is, not just for entrepreneurship, but for all the sustainable development goals. So that would be one thing. In terms of partnerships, again, to be able to look across various different sectors to see how these kinds of tools can be integrated um, within you know, sustainability research, within health, et cetera. And, Building this public-private partnership, I, I think that can easily be kind of uh, expanded as long as people understand that this is not a, oh, yes, this is a little thing that we can add on to technical training, but a necessary foundation if we want people to succeed in their lives. That's all. I feel like that connects with Michael's points on the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And I think a question we are seeing, I mean, we're going to run out of time very soon. One question that I'm going to broadly open up to everyone is, I see your point about this, you know, Anita, about needing this kind of training broadly. But I think a lot of implementing partners often are thinking about how do I make sure who this is suitable for? And is there something that we can measure at baseline to understand where people are in their personal agency or their entrepreneurial mindset. I'm going to like leave that as a final question and sort of see, you know, who like if I, I see Michael's raised his hand and he wants to speak to this question, but I will sort of, you know, there's been a lot of great questions. We haven't been able to answer all of them and we've tried in the chat and then, uh, but we'll, we'll sort of have this final question to like, who should we target these training programs to and how do we decide who is it suited for? Michael. Uh, I, I think that there's one datum that, that speaks for what Anita was just talking about. And that is uh, actually people who went through the STEP training, they got a job more easily, um, even though we trained them to be not looking for a job. Uh, so, uh, so there is something generalizable about it. However, um, I, I also had negative experiences with trainers that were um, entrepreneurs. So I do think that entrepreneurs are often very much wedded to their own story. 
And so they uh, sort of continue start talking about their own story too long. And they need structure that actually helps them to overcome that problem of being oriented towards their own story. So in a way that speaks again for Anita's point that they need to broaden the approach. It's not just to be a fantastic entrepreneur, but it's also to broaden the approach of looking at negative feedback and dealing with one's errors and dealing with one's problems and dealing with the walls that one hits in one's life. Um, but the problem is, of course, uh, that, um, that we need to have both. We need to have somebody who is able to talk fluently about the experience of entrepreneurship. And at the same time, we need somebody who needs a structure and who has a structure to actually talk about certain kinds of things instead or, or better to have um, uh, to, to have exercises on certain kinds of things. And so I think therefore the combination of a structure and the type of, of entrepreneurs that, that Salman was talking about uh, is, is probably ideal. In general, I do think that this leads to broader things, but quite frankly, when we looked in recent, in, in, in long, long time ago work, not recent, long time ago work, we actually did not always find that personal initiative was, was going sort of in a general empowerment dimension, but it was still specific to the kinds of things where you do learn how to show personal initiative. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And I guess uh, related to that question, does anyone have a point to make on targeting? Like, do you feel like it's, a, it, is there a way to identify who needs this training more than somebody else? Like, are there tools that exist to measure initial baseline personal initiative, for instance? Michael, again. Okay. Okay. I, I do have an idea about targeting, but the problem about targeting is, um, uh, I think uh, David still remembers that we tried everything under the sun to find out whether there were certain kinds of people who were actually better served by the personal initiative training than others. For example, those who were particularly bad in terms of profitability, were they actually getting more? or those who were particularly good in, in, in dealings, et cetera. We never ever found real differences. It's really difficult to sort of have a clear profile of the kinds of people where that kind of training really works best. I see David's raised his hand. <laughs> Last point. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. let me just say on that, I, I mean, I think within the context of the types of small firm owners, it's very hard unless you have very, very large samples that are bigger than the types that we've had to really find those differences. I think we sort of, you know, perhaps think that the, the very smallest subsistence people who have no interest in ever signing up for training are probably not gonna be as benefited and the people who are going into accelerators and are already running big firms are not gonna benefit, but within the range of sort of the types of small firms that, that I typically work a lot of these organizations are working with it was very hard to find you, you know depending on baseline levels any any differences and so um thanks let me stop thank you so much and i guess this where well, we've reached the very end of our um of our webinar we've gone a little over it's been like a fascinating discussion and a whole set of like interesting questions for the future you know what we see is there is promise in this type of intervention more research is needed around targeting the curricula the types of interventions that we want to add on along with these types of training programs we also need partnerships like from the private sector with donors with with implementing partners and so as as Carla had mentioned at the beginning of her presentation the best bets are like an invitation for coalitions of implementers, researchers, and funders to capitalize on the existing knowledge of what works and invest in answering remaining questions as we scale these interventions. We invite you to get in touch if today's webinar 
and open questions touch on your plans for 2024 and beyond, and you see an opportunity for collaboration. Thank you all for joining today's webinar. A special thank you to our presenters and panelists. I, it, I know it's particularly late for those of you connecting in from Asia, so special thank you to them. Uh, we appreciate and value your partnership and collaboration in moving the research and policy agenda on this topic forward. From all of us here at IPA, thank you for connecting and being engaged throughout the Q&A. A recording will soon be available on our website. And if you have any more questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Have a lovely rest of your day and thank you.